We are very pleased to present to you Dr. Ivan Ulrich. Dr. Ulrich is a former senior fellow with the for Strategic Security Program at the Federation of American Scientists. He focuses on issues related to nuclear testing and the testing moratorium, proliferation of nuclear weapons and nuclear materials, the structure of US, future U.S. nuclear forces, and the exciting conventional military forces in the post-World War, War world. His previous work at the Institute for Defense Analysis focused on environmental restorations of lands belonging to the U.S. Department of Defense and Department of Energy. We ask uh, Dr. Ulrich to join us today to educate us on the relationship between the nuclear fuel cycle on the civilian side and the nuclear weapons liberation issue that is, of course, uh, continues to be uh, of paramount importance ever since the genie got out of the bottle in 1945. With that, uh, I turn you over to Dr. Ulrich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I'm sitting here because I, I do not have a view graph, so I thought it would be better just to sit. And uh, I'm very pleased with the invitation to come and address you. It's also very humbling to be in this very beautiful surroundings and beautiful Vancouver on the anniversary of Tragedy, uh, suffered by the Japanese people. <clears throat> and uh, as uh, you were told, the topic I've been asked to address is, is not specific to that, uh, the, the nuclear accidents in Japan, but it concerns the entire global nuclear enterprise, and that's the connection between nuclear power and the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons. I'm going to give sort of a general description of how it works rather than looking at specific countries. Uh, but there is a close and, and almost inevitable uh, connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Uh, inevitable might mean that the problem is hopeless and we should give up. But it is a hopeless. It's, it's an important problem. It's worth working hard to avoid. It is a difficult problem. But I added that almost because I think that we can with careful technical design, with, uh, international regulations, and I believe a fundamental change in how we view the nuclear power industry, we can minimize the danger if not entirely eliminated. Um, all of today's uh, established or, or recognized uh, nuclear power, nuclear weapons power, those recognized by the non-proliferation treaty, uh, completely integrated their early civilian and military nuclear research. And in fact, the military applications came first. The first nuclear reactors were used to, to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons, and the knowledge gained from that military experience was incorporated later into the first civilian nuclear reactors. The first uranium enrichment, using enormous gas diffusion plants, uh, were built to, uh, to, to provide highly enriched uranium for nuclear bombs, and only later low enriched uh, uranium for nuclear reactors. Unfortunately, this road runs in both directions, and now we're worried about the reverse process, uh, civilian technology being applied to military uses. Uh, and the nuclear reactors themselves are not the major proliferation problem. It's the process of making the fuel that goes into the reactors, and sometimes uh, what we do with the fuel when it comes out of the reactors. This whole process from mining the uranium to the disposal of radioactive waste is called the nuclear fuel cycle, and that's what we have to watch. Uh, nuclear weapons can be powered by either uranium or plutonium, and both elements are intimately tied to the nuclear fuel cycle. Uranium, uh, as we learned earlier today, is a naturally occurring element. It's fairly common. Uh, it's found throughout the world. Canada, turns out, has some of the world's very richest deposits, if not the largest deposits of uranium. And Canada is, is, uh, has been and continues to be a major uranium exporter. Uh, Uranium, uh, like most elements, I'm getting that a little tutorial this morning, has different isotopes, they're called. And that is atoms with the same number of protons and electrons, so they're chemically almost identical. But they have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. That makes them have slightly different weights. And um, also, putting a, diff a different number of neutrons in the nucleus can give uh, the, uh, well, I should say, 
can typically gives the, uh, the atoms radically different uh, nuclear properties, even if the chemical properties are the same. <laughs> so uranium has two main isotopes. There's 235 and 238, and that number just is the total number of protons and neutrons, and it's proportional to the weight and mass of the, of the uh, atom. And it's the 235 that powers nuclear reactors, and also nuclear bombs. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately if you're a nuclear reactor operator, uh, the uranium-235 uh, that powers the reactor is less than 1% of natural uranium, 7 tenths of 1% to be exact. So to be able to get the uranium to react or burn in those common types of reactors, the concentration of the 235 has to be increased above that what is, what is normally found in natural uranium. And this process is called enrichment. So while natural uranium is 0.7% of uranium-235, nuclear reactor fuel typically has ranges of 3 to 5% of uranium-235. Anything below 20% is called low-enriched uranium, uh, or LEU. And that has, the, they make a distinction more or less than 20% low-enriched and high-enriched uranium that's have to be handled very, uh, very differently because of the security concerns. Many techniques have been used to enrich uranium, but today, far and away, the most popular is to use high-speed centrifuges to exploit the small difference in mass between the two atoms to separate the two isotopes of uranium. So, but uranium-235 is also a compatible nuclear bomb, and for that, the 235 ought to be enriched not to the 3 to 5 percent that you see in a nuclear reactor, but to 80 percent or 90 percent or more since it's above 20%, it's called highly enriched uranium, or HEU. And that's where the problems start. Because exactly the same pieces of equipment that can enrich to 5% can also enrich to 95%. And when I say same pieces of equipment, I don't mean similar technology or machines based on the same principles or built in the same way. I mean exactly the same physical pieces of equipment. Anybody who can enrich uranium uh, at all can get whatever enrichment they want simply by passing the material repeatedly back through the same machines. And unfortunately, the enrichment requirements for uh, needed to produce nuclear weapons are significantly smaller than those needed to power nuclear power plants. So if I build a uh, plant ostensibly to power a large uh, commercial nuclear power plant, I'll have the capability to build roughly 20 nuclear, uh, I'll have the enrichment capacity to enrich enough uranium build about 20 nuclear bombs a year. And this is why the world is so concerned about Iran's uh, centrifuge program. You know, Iran claims that the centrifuges are entirely for peaceful purposes. Uh, not everybody outside of Iran is fully convinced that that's true. But let's assume that it is true. There's still the problem that Iran could later use exactly those same machines to continue enrichment to levels that could be used to build a bomb. So today, most of the world's enrichment capacity is in those countries that already have nuclear weapons. And so we can say, well, that doesn't present any additional uh, proliferation risk. The area of the problem is the countries have the nuclear weapons, not that they might get them. Uh, the big exception is one company, uh, Eurinco, that is a uh, Dutch, British, German consortium. Uh, Britain is, of course, a nuclear power, and I don't think anybody is particularly concerned about Netherlands and Germany's proliferation threat. But many countries that are uh, interested in purchasing nuclear reactors have also shown an interest in getting enrichment technology and enrichment facilities. Uh, Brazil has uh, three reactors, two operating, one under construction, and it has developed its own uranium enrichment capacity. Uh, Jordan and Japan are, have uh, made it clear that they would like to at least consider at the preliminary stages of talking about getting nuclear power plants, and they've made it clear that they would like to uh, at least have an option for uranium enrichment in Jordan and Japan and not two countries that we think of as particularly uh, technologically advanced, but they want to be able to enrich uranium. And saying no to these countries now is very difficult uh, because all of the countries with established nuclear power industries want to pretend that enriching uranium is just another industry, like steel or oil refining. But remember the equipment that's used to make enriched uranium for power plants is exactly the equipment that could be used to make the stuff of nuclear weapons. And um, highly enriched uranium, 
can be used in the very simplest possible bomb design. It's called a gun assembly bomb. Uh, other bomb, the other approach is what's called a, you know, a lens, a, a, a implosion bomb, and that is a technical technically a greater challenge. Gun assemble bomb is, is the simplest type of bomb design. The first bomb used in war over Hiroshima was a gun assemble bomb powered by uranium 235. And the United States was so confident that it would work, it didn't even test it before using it against Japan. The, to treat uranium enrichment as just another industry, I think, is just crazy. So remember, keeping in mind what we can use this for. Now, a lot of countries make the arguments that uh, they want to have uranium enrichment capacity because they want to, they're looking for energy security, they're looking for guaranteed fuel supplies, but these arguments just ring hollow. Uh, no nation has energy independence. It's a, it's a, a politically very attractive myth, but it's a myth. Uh, countries that want to enrich uranium, they do not have the ability to build their own nuclear reactors, so they're depending on other countries to provide spare parts and technical support, so they're never going to be Countries, countries that have nuclear reactor industries are fully integrated into a global manufacturing base. Uh, I have visited the manufacturing facilities in both in Japan and Korea, and the Japanese admit that the, the Japanese manufacturers admit that they depend on Korea for key components to their reactors, and the Korean manufacturers admit they depend on Japan for key components of their reactors. Neither industry is, is, is truly independent. <coughs> and both Japan and Korea depend on technology that's licensed from the United States. I think the world ought to be heading in the opposite direction of treating this as, as a, a normal commercial enterprise. Uh, the uranium fuel production and particularly enrichment should not be under any nation's control. It should be internationalized. National control just simply shouldn't be considered legitimate. I, admittedly, there are some technical and political and managerial challenges. For example, we would not want to have international enrichment centers with an international staff to sort of become graduate schools for nuclear proliferation. You send your guys over to this place and they all learn how to enrich uranium and then they come back and they start your own uh, enrichment centers. But there are ways around this. For example, we need to have very few countries that maintain the know-how to manufacture centrifuges. And those countries that manufacture centrifuges would not be allowed to enrich uranium. Uh, so you'd have to make a choice. Am I going to be a, man a centrifuge manufacturer or a centrifuge operator? Uh, a lot of us uh, here know how to operate uh, laptop computers, but that doesn't mean that we know how to manufacture them. Uh, the established nuclear powers might even consider schemes like subsidizing enrichment uh, so that any country that opts out is immediately suspect. Uh, the cost of enrichment is small compared to the cost of producing electricity with with nuclear power about 4%, so subsidies would not distort the market very much. And every country that has a nuclear power program is heavily subsidized by the government. So one way to put that is to say subsidies to uh, enrichment would not uh, skew the, distort the market any more than it already is. So governments balk at taking control of the enrichment uh, industry. This suggestion is always met with uh, accusations that it's, that it's simply nationalization, which is politically widely unpopular today around the world. Uh, and it's looked at, at that rather than in, in commercial terms rather than security terms. But I, if the will were there, it'd be easy to do uh, based on worldwide production and Western production costs, if I don't get production costs from China and Russia. The global enrichment industry is perhaps $6 billion a year, and according to my unimpeachable uh, research on Google, that's uh, less than half of what the world spends every year on potato chips. The American firm of the United States Enrichment Corporation has a market capitalization now of only a quarter of a billion dollars after its stock has, has uh, fallen, uh, in large part because it's had a terrible time trying to compete with Urinco. Um, it's come to the United States government saying that they should get some sort of subsidy so they maintain a, a a domestically owned uh, enrichment company, and, uh, uh, and they make arguments about energy security. Uh, and I just think that that's, if, if, you, if USEC is going to go bankrupt, then the United States ought to let it go bankrupt. Um, in addition, a global consortium creates a positive goal for 
countries like you know, the current glaring example is Iran, the current in the world is left Iran with no option other than a surrender, uh, which is very difficult for them to accept, uh, to swallow politically because of their domestic political requirements. So enter, but entering in a truly international consortium as a partner but provides Iran with a face that would uh, climb down. And of course, you know, Iran might refuse, but at least in that case, its intentions are clear. Uh, I think that Japan can play a role by setting an example. Japan has a well-developed nuclear industry, and at least up until last year, depended heavily on nuclear power. We'll see how that develops in the future, whether Japan goes or you know, returns to its, its nuclear past. But in any case, Japan has only a tiny enrichment capacity, although it had until recently plans to increase that. You know, almost all of its uh, enrichment capacity it gets uh, buys from foreign sources just uh, through commercial contracts, proving that a very highly advanced industrial uh, country can depend on the international market to provide uh, uh, enrichment. And finally, uh, Canada, uh, which does not enrich uranium, but is one of the world's largest producers of uranium has has a voice in the global uranium market and I think has the political credibility to speak out about how the global uranium market ought to be organized. So there's a role I think there for um, Canada. One final point on enrichment, uh, there's currently research and development on developing a new laser-based technology for, for uranium uh, enrichment. I don't want to sound like a, uh, a Luddite, but I think that this uh, effort ought to simply be stopped. It's, it's not needed. As I said, the cost of enrichment is only about 4% of the cost of producing nuclear electricity. And that's at the bus bar, that's not what you pay at your, at your home. So even if we reduce the enrichment cost to zero, it would not have a big effect on the overall cost of nuclear electricity. And laser enrichment opens up the possibility of very small, essentially undetectable facilities that are able to make highly enriched uranium in a single step, and it would just be a proliferation nightmare. And any potential, uh, commercial benefits would be outweighed by the security risks. So that is a discussion of what goes into the nuclear reactor. I said reactors themselves are not really the proliferation problem, but what about what comes out of the nuclear reactor on the other end? So remember I said that uranium has two main isotopes. I was just, everything I've been discussing is really devoted to uranium-235, which is the isotope that, that uh, is the one that splits in the reactor releasing enormous amounts of energy. The other isotope is uranium-238, and that's much more stable. Uh, when it is hit by a neutron in a, react uh, in a reactor, it does not split and produce energy, at least not directly. But some of the 238 atoms will absorb a neutron, so 238 becomes uranium-239, and that converts into a process of, of uh, nuclear decay with plutonium-239. And that is the other material that can provide the explosive power for a nuclear bomb. Uh, plutonium as an element, unlike uranium, uh, does not occur in nature. But a standard nuclear power reactor produces many tens of kilograms of, of plutonium per year, at least. Uh, probably five or six uh, kilograms, depending on your sophistication of, as a bomb designer, five or six kilograms of plutonium are required to build a bomb. Uh, and when the fuel rod is pulled from a normal, or a, a typical nuclear reactor, uh, it's probably about 1% plutonium. So it's important to keep in mind that plutonium is a different element from uranium, has different chemical properties. So while it's a real technical challenge to separate one isotope of uranium from another, plutonium and uranium have different chemical properties, and they can be separated using uh, bulk chemical means. I'm not trying to say that this is easy because when the stuff comes out of the reactor, it's in, intensely radioactive. So everything has to be done with it by robots and remote control. It's, it's not easy to do, but it's easier <coughs> technically. It requires less technical sophistication than building the centrifuges. Uh, there is a process that was developed in World War II called the uh, Purex process, and uh, variations on that are what are still in use today. Um, it's true also that the plutonium that comes out of the typical commercial reactor is not ideal for nuclear weapons, but the United States Department of Energy has uh, designed, built, and exploded 
uh, nuclear bombs using uh, plutonium from commercial reactors. So uh, it might not be ideal, but it does, in fact, do the job. Uh, of course, the plutonium has to be separated from the used nuclear fuel before it can be used in a weapon. Uh, and several countries do this separation, and why? And I think there, well, there's the official reason, and there is what I think is the real reason. The official reason is to recover all that energy that's locked up in the plutonium. Um, if you can, uh, it can power a nuclear weapon, true, uh, but it can also be used in a nuclear reactor, in a nuclear fuel. Uh, if we separated uh, the, the plutonium a process, and through a process that's called reprocessing, and run it back through the reactor, which uh, during the Bush administration, the Department of Energy started calling recycling, so we were dealing with newspapers and we were cans. Uh, we could get that energy out from the plutonium. And in fact, the plutonium is an indirect way to exploit that potential energy that's locked up in the plutonium to create. Remember that more than 99% of the natural uranium is uranium 238. So if we could get all if we could get this scheme to work, we could get a hundred times more energy out of a given amount of uranium. Uh, alas, there are some technical problems with this approach. Uh, as I said, the, the nuclear fuel is very radioactive, uh, dangerous uh, to handle, and it turns out that it's extremely expensive to try to separate out the time. Um, and it is just from a purely commercial point of view, it's always cheaper, and based on some work that I've done, this, will probably, this statement will probably be true to the, for the rest of the century. It's cheaper just to dig fresh uranium. An even greater hurdle is that to really exploit plutonium, you need a different type of nuclear reactor, one that's called a fast neutron reactor. Uh, the world has spent probably a, a minimum of $50 billion on research and development and has never had a commercially successful fast reactor. The Russians do have one that's operating, but it would not come anywhere close to meeting uh, Western safety standards. Uh, several countries have separated plutonium in the past, and France continues to this day, as does Russia, but we know less about their program. And I discuss this a lot uh, in Washington, I talk to congressional uh, offices, and they ask me, well, if plutonium separation is such a bad idea, why does France do it? And the reason has to do with these fast reactors, that back in the 60s and the 70s, Britain, France, and the United States had programs to develop the fast reactors and programs to develop the reprocessing to create the plutonium to go into the fast reactors. In all three cases, uh, the fast reactor program failed. And in the United States, we canceled the reprocessing program that would go along with it, its sister program. And uh, someone should write a PhD dissertation on the uh, momentum of bureaucracy. But in Britain and France, they went ahead with the reprocessing program, even though the fast reactor program failed. And as a result, today, Britain has 100 tons of separated plutonium, and the French have 80 tons of separated plutonium. And I'll remind you, you need five or six uh, kilograms to make a bomb, so each ton might be up to, say, 200 bombs. So that, the, the, the official reason is to extend energy supply, I think, but what is the real reason? I think it has to do with politics of the nuclear waste problem. Basically, the French are storing a generation's worth of nuclear waste above ground. And again, if they said that, it would be politically unacceptable. But if you get a bunch of guys in white lab coats with clipboards to walk around and poke it every now and then, then you can call it reprocessing, and that's OK. And so it's a way of allowing them to put off by decades a decision about where to put a permanent geological repository, which you might have followed the, the great political pain that we went through in a country like the United States, which is like Canada, is large, uh, very sparsely uh, populated areas. Even we had a terrible political uh, time trying to find, and we eventually failed with the upper mountain in Nevada. Um, you can imagine how difficult it would be in a highly, uh, a densely populated country like France or Japan. So there's a huge political incentive to put off as long as possible that decision and dealing with that, but at the same time to be able to justify the current operation of existing nuclear power plants. 
What's most distressing about this reprocessing story is not that Britain and France made this mistake uh, 40 years ago and found themselves at this dead end, but that Japan and Korea want to start off on exactly that same path now. The Japanese experience with their large uh, fast reactor has not been good. They've had sodium fires, it's been shut down. It's just recently started a very, very limited, uh, well, up until the earthquake, it was operating at uh, sort of testing levels of power. <coughs> And they were planning on restarting, uh, reprocessing. Uh, political opposition in Korea to permanent geological repositories is extremely intense. Uh, and it's, so it's clear to me, so the Koreans have a, a desire to sell politically, but, but nuclear power is very popular in Korea. And so there's this dilemma. So one of the ways they try to, to square that circle is that they, uh, uh, they have, have this political narrative that they're going to solve the waste problem with fast reactors. But it's clear to me that Korea and Japan settled off on this path that 30 years from now they're going to be where Britain and France are today with tons of separated plutonium that is a huge danger and of no use. Uh, there's one case which uh, Canada might play a role in this in the future. Uh, Canada has uh, designed and manufactured and exported uh, these so-called can-do reactors. Canada, these are reactors uh, that are uh, of a different des design than most of the light water reactors uh, in use in the world today. And they would be ideal for a small nuclear uh, weapons program. Uh, as far as I know, there are no current orders for the reactor, although the uh, Canadians would like there to be. I think in large part, this is because of the overall collapse of the nuclear reactor industry. But also, in part, it's because modern centrifuges have now made uh, uh, enriched uranium so cheap that the can-do reactors, which are so efficient with their neutrons, can use natural uranium. Uh, their, their relative economic uh, advantage has gone away because of cheap uh, enrichment. So I, because there are no outstanding orders or, or requests right now, it's not an immediate problem. But if the market should revive, then Canada has to be very careful that can-do reactors or successors to can-do reactors are uh, sold <coughs> Only with extremely tight control of the uh, uh, of the fuel reprocessing uh, to make the extraction of plutonium impossible. And with that, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>